Welcome to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. When I learned that I was not doing a great job uh, helping my patients heal, uh, and I was primarily focused on using medications, procedures, and surgeries, I was faced with this, uh, this, rec- this realization that my conventional training, although extremely helpful in some situations, was not the best way to help uh, my patients understand what the root causes of their diseases were. And, and it didn't really help me heal them. So today, I want you to meet a clinician like myself who was able to think outside the box and find another way to help my patients and her patients heal. Today's guest is Dr. Akita Evans. She is a board-certified family medicine doc like myself and trained in functional medicine as well. She received her training at Brown Medical School and completed her residency at the Carolinas Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina, where she served as the chief resident, which is important because the chief residents really have to lead their teams. She also earned a master's of public health from Harvard School of Public Health, and she uh, practiced in Mantapon Community Health Center in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. She has a passion for individualized care, and that includes genetics, family history, and lifestyle to optimize physical, mental, and spiritual health. She also understands and recognizes that the, you know, individual treatment, um, of her patients focused on their individual needs will help them and their communities and everybody involved to live a, a very healthy life. So I'm really excited because she she gets it. She's not just a medicines, procedures, and surgeries uh, clinician. And I'm really happy to welcome you, Akita. How are you doing? And welcome. Yes, thank you for the welcome. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm having a, a busy, beautiful day. I think we're... <laughs> I shared before we started the uh, recording that in Chicago, we we got our first snow. So, uh, man, trying to get home to uh, spend some time with you uh, recording this podcast was a little challenging, but I'm just happy I'm here. And I've been looking forward to this because uh, we have a lot in common, a lot of the same interests, and I think we're trying to achieve similar goals. So I'm really excited to introduce you to my audience. And, and I really look forward to all the great work you're going to do in, in the field of medicine and beyond. So so let's get started. Um, I was uh, checking out your Instagram and and it was right around the holidays. And look at look and look on what did I see this beautiful family. <laughs> I see two beautiful children. I see your husband. So let's start off by you telling us a little bit about how you and your husband met. Yes, um, Stephen and I are both from New Orleans, and so we met in high school at Ben Franklin High School in ninth grade. Um, because of our last names, we were seated next to each other in homeroom. We graduated next to each other. We did gym class, school projects, birthday parties. So we were just friends. <laughs> and then, like um, after Hurricane Katrina, we reconnected, and it went from "Oh, how's your mom and them doing?" to well, how are you doing? You know, and how was your day? And then it blossomed to a relationship. I love it. So here we are almost, you know, a little over 10 years later. And what's the ages of your kids? They are two and four. All right, cool. Your story reminds me of my medical assistant, uh, Denise Avalos, who just got married. So shout out to Denise, Mm -hmm. (laughs) who's just starting her journey. But same thing happened to her. They just have had a similar last name. (laughs) So (laughs) so maybe that's the secret to dating, you know, (laughs) sitting next to somebody (laughs) based on your name. So that's really cute. So thanks for sharing that. I think that's a great, great start to our discussion. I also uh, uh, shared in your intro that you uh, went to Brown and, and, and Harvard. I remember when my kids were uh, looking at schools out east and uh, my, they actually both went to Brown for a summer program, oh. believe it or not. And uh, they didn't quite like Harvard or Brown because it was too old for them. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's an old school, so I'm sure you can mm-hmm. uh, recollect. But, but I'm curious about, um, you know, your this ideal of uh, learning and being a really good student, doing really well. It, was there somebody in your family who helped, you know, kind of motivate and inspire you towards being a, a lifelong learner? Yeah, a lot of people in my family, parents, grandparents were educators, but in particular, 
my grandfather was the first Dr. Evans. Um, he did his doctorate in kinesiology, had a long, lifelong passion for health and wellness, and mm-hmm. was recruited to Jackson State in the 70s, where he and my grandmother taught for, for decades. But um, when we would check in with him, he was concerned about what we were eating. So he set the standard for nutrition in our family. We had to be physically active and participate in sports. And when I was conditioning for track, you know, he would add miles onto what the coach was already giving me because, you know, I was like, I'm a sprinter. But he's like, if you get your endurance up, your sprints will be better. And then he wanted to know what we were learning and we were studying and pursuing. And so he really set the standard um, for for us in the family. He was a lifelong learner, always writing, always reading, always publishing. And we just follow suit. Yeah, well, that that makes a lot of sense, and I I can believe everything you're saying. It's just I know for me, being a lifelong learner is probably how I ended up uh, being a a doc who thinks outside the box because yeah. you keep learning these things and you can't yes. un- unlearn it. So it's been really uh, really cool to be a lifelong learner and to and to grow in that uh, vein, and and that really helps me to ask the next question which is related to functional medicine. Uh, You know, I'm getting a master's in nutrition and functional medicine. You've gotten training in that area. So most of our colleagues who were conventionally trained um, don't really have a good sense of even what that is and what that means. So what made you decide to uh, get that additional training in functional medicine? Well, it came from um, a personal health journey. Um, Shortly after Stephen and I were married, well, not several years into our marriage, it was kind of like, where are the children? You know, <laughs> so just trying to figure out what was wrong and how to make it right. And I went to conventional medicine doctors because that's how I was trained. And I exhausted those options. And I didn't really like what was offered to me in the form of procedures and pills. Mm-hmm. And so really late night internet searches led me to functional medicine, reading blogs. It was, it was, it's medicine, but it's wild how we're not introduced to that framework in medical school. And so after self-study and self-improvement, I decided to get the formal training. So, and that's what led me to opening my practice. Yeah, that's, that's, well, I'm glad that worked out because you have two beautiful kids. So, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, yeah, so many people, uh, previous guests uh, have talked about fertility issues that got them into you know, wellness and root cause. And I think it's really important that everybody who is looking for answers understand that there's probably an answer. And if conventional medicine is not finding answers, uh, there are other clinicians who can help. So the good news is that conventional medicine helps with a lot of things. But but man, when it comes to thinking differently about how we approach patients, it's all, you know, you just keep asking why, why, why until you get an answer. And there's always a reason, you know, it's just like a person who gets older. I had a patient today and she said, well, you know, I just assume that I'm just getting older and that's why I feel the way I do. And I said, well, you know, I got patients that are your age. They're not feeling that way. Yes. So maybe there's, maybe there's more to it. So I think we have to be able to think outside the box. So, so that's, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, I, I was uh, laughing as I thought about your roots in New Orleans and, <laughs> I think we both have some roots in New Orleans, and I saw you, um, you know, in front of uh, that beignet shop yes. on one of your Instagram <laughs> pictures. And shout out to New Orleans, and let's be clear, the low-carb doctor, the metabolic health doctor cannot go to New Orleans and not eat a beignet. <laughs> that that would be a uh, blasphemy. <laughs> so, so I really appreciate uh, that. So, so talk a little bit about because uh, in your in in the post I saw it said that you were uh, you you weren't doing uh, low carb that day, right? So no. that's yeah. So that suggests that you do low carb on other days. So talk a little bit about um, you know what got you eating uh, that way, and because I know in my training it's mm-hmm. it tends to be more plant based uh, mm-hmm. with functional and nutrition. So what got you leaning towards maybe a low carb diet? Yeah. And and to your point about that day in particular, because I made a decision that it wasn't going to be a low carb day, it it still had to be like an intermittent fasting day. So Mm. every day we make decisions and try to mitigate whatever potential damage we're doing to, you know, with our lifestyle choices, but low carb 
works, we have evidence um, that is really helpful with cardiometabolic disease. And statistics tell us, and you know, our patient populations tell us that most of our patients with chronic illnesses are going to have diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And for me, I'm seeing a lot of women with PCOS, insulin resistance. All of these conditions can improve with a low-carb diet. A lot of patients will come to me wanting a natural way to treat their conditions or a holistic therapy. And it's easy for us to equate that with, well, what supplements can I take? Mm-hmm. What um, herbal tea can I drink? Let's just start with nutrition. Most people don't realize how many carbs we intake Mm -mm. on a daily basis. And so I love going through that exercise with patients and doing a carb count, doing a 24-hour diet recall, and sometimes making those small changes, making swaps, or just decreasing um, the intake can make a tremendous impact on their their cardiometabolic disease. So I I do it because I need to do it for my health, you know, and yes, and, and I encourage my patients to do it too. And, and and the number of illnesses that are in that cardiometabolic category is vast. Yes. And the majority of the chronic illnesses that we deal with include that. So I think that that's really important to emphasize. I also think it's important to emphasize what you said. You said, let's keep it simple mm-hmm. and let's make small changes. And, yes. and, and I think clinicians, if we just listen to our patients, and get a feel for what they're willing to do or not do, that'll that'll reduce some of the tension because people are very afraid when you're like, you got to change your diet. And uh, But the good thing about a low-carb diet, and thankfully the American Diabetes Association, the, Ameri- the clinical, I think it's the Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, and, and others are starting to say, hey, that's a dietary option you can consider. So I take some of the we don't have to be pioneers as much yeah. as we were a few years ago. It was just, you know, nobody was saying that. So, but I just really think it's important that we talk to patients and say, hey, this is a change, but if you, this low carb thing is actually not that hard because if you start asking them, so tell me what kind of foods do you like? A lot of the foods they li- already like are okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's not, you know, it's like, it's not that hard. So I think they have to, you know, focus on what they can eat, not what they can't. And, and just enjoy the foods they currently enjoy. And then beyond that, they can start to experiment with things like maybe the uh, cauliflower rice or whatever if they've never tried that. So I think it's all about, you know, keeping it simple, small changes, and understanding that metabolic disease is the foundation for wellness. If we can master that and be metabolically healthy, the body just works so much better. So I love that. It does take, uh, I think you're in your own private practice. So uh, I'm in a big health system, and um, in some ways that's easier because I have people doing stuff for me, right? And uh, you're you're kind of doing a different model where you're trying to have your own practice, right? So what gave? First of all, what gave you the courage to do that? <laughs> you're not even sure, right? <laughs> like it's, sometimes it's like, like we're really doing this. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I and I know it fits the functional medicine model better, but yeah, what kind of what was going through your head when you decided to take that leap? I actually did not start off in medicine with this desire. You know, in third year residency, we have a little bit of exposure to practice management. I feel like I was trained to be a really good employed physician as far as Mm -hmm. productivity and meeting quality measures. But I, I would have conversations with my father through the years about different issues, being an employee physician. And he was like, well, you can start your own practice. You can do this on your own. You can have your own business. And um, he was an entrepreneur after his time in the Navy. He, he had his own business. And so my father actually passed away Easter season 2018. Mm-hmm. And it was like December 30th, 2018. So wait a minute. It's almost a year after my dad has died. And I'm mm-hmm. still doing what I was doing and not doing what I told him I was going to do. So the next day I typed up a letter of resignation and just said, I'm going to just go for it. <laughs> you know? wow. And, and that, that's really how it started. And in May of 2019, I, I, um, I opened my practice. I, it, it was a lot of things I had to learn from like how to get commercial. It was a lot of things I had to learn, but um, conversations with him and then understanding how time was just passing by and I had not done what I said I was going to do kind of just pushed me into to resigning from the job that I had Mm -hmm. and opening my practice. Wow. The people who 
have uh, left us physically. They're still with mm-hmm. us oh, emotionally, yes. spiritually, and he's still inspiring you and helping you uh, guide you, which is kind of cool. It's like he's holding your hand. Oh, yes. uh, it's so, so cool. So, and I, and, 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 and just so everybody who's listening is aware, we're going to have a conversation about a book. Uh, and that book is called The Big Leap. And, and I, I had to think about it now because you took a big leap. And, and we're going to do a little bit of a book review. That'll be on the uh, Your, that's why you are a uh, health network, uh, which is on Roku and Fire Stick or whatever those things are called. <laughs> so uh, just know that. And it's also, uh, we'll, we'll be sharing that. So I just wanted to put that out there. But I really think that um, it takes courage to make those kind of changes. And I just think that, but in order to have, you know, what you really want it to be, sometimes it's nice to just kind of do your own thing. So, so that integration of functional medicine into your practice. Um, how hard has that been? Because I know that in my training, you have to take the time and, you know, you have to, you know, do a functional medicine timeline and right. matrix and all of these things that really allow you to go backwards and look at, at the history of the patient. You really get to tell their story yes. by doing these things. But but practically, it can be a challenge. Uh, so how have you been able to kind of work through those challenges of integrating those concepts into your practice? Yeah, I'm still learning every day. I have a micro practice. So as you mentioned, you have a team. I'm still working on building the team because it's still a relatively new practice. Mm-hmm. So I do a lot of the intake myself. Um, you mentioned earlier listening to patients. We know a lot of the times the diagnosis is in the history, but that takes time. But I accept insurance and I have an insurance model. So I'm trying to blend the two. Um, One thing that really helps is I do a lot of history gathering before the first appointment. So every new patient has the opportunity to fill out long, extensive forms. And depending on a person's medical history, the form can take at least 20, 30 minutes to fill out. Hmm. It's asking everything from what did your mama feed you when you're three months old to how did you feel yesterday? You know, so it's over the lifespan and... When people fill it out and I'm able to review it ahead of the appointment, I feel like I really know them and it's a good start. If they don't fill it out before, then I'm going to just spend the time um, gathering information. And so while a traditional functional medicine practice may have two, three hours for the first appointment, I have about a good solid 20 minutes and we're Mm going to get a good start and schedule follow up and follow up and just work things out that way. So it is important to listen and know a patient's story. And honestly, sometimes it takes me a while to even get the whole story because it can be like, oh, yeah, and I now remember. And, oh, you know, so it's also about relationship building, whether I was practicing only conventional or a blend of conventional and functional, you know, you have to have that relationship and have that time um, to really be good um, partners on the healthcare team partners with your patients. Yeah, I I think that's important to message that, you know, you're, it sounds like you have a very conventional schedule, but you integrate it into your conventional model and you just have more follow-up appointments. In some ways that may be helpful because, you know, you and the patient have time to process and think yes. through and, oh yeah, like you said, you have that aha moment and you've had time to kind of maybe do some research or to put the pieces together. And and most of the conditions that plague us took a while to occur. And it's, so it's okay to just spend a little time trying to figure it out. Because once you figure it out, ooh-wee, yes. it's a sweet spot. You're like, oh my God, I don't have to live with this yeah. chronic condition for the rest of my life. I don't, you know, maybe my MS can be treated naturally in a way that I had not thought about or my Sjogren's or whatever I'm facing. And so many people are benefiting from this approach. So I really think that's awesome. Um, Another thing that comes to mind, another thing I saw you talk about in a post, and it it talked about um, this idea of, uh, you know, glycation in products, right? So we're getting a little medical here, but um, I just want to dive into that just a little bit uh, understand, you know, where do they come from and how uh, to avoid them. And, impo- and before you comment, one of my future guests, um, uh, Sybil Cooper, uh, she actually uh, had read a study, and I'll probably talk more about this when I uh, talk to her, 
that suggested that this glycation problem uh, is a bigger problem in communities of color. Uh, that Yeah, so it's like, and a lot of people don't know that. Uh, so when we talk about restricting carbs and things like that, the impact on communities of color is greater. So it's not just because mama made the sweet potato pie. I know some of us do pumpkin pie, so shout out to all the people <laughs> who eat pumpkin pie. But But the bottom line is, it's not just the sweet potato pie. There are some other things going on in certain cultures that make them more predisposed to having problems with uh, carbs. So talk a little bit about this concept so people understand it. Uh, so the um, advanced glycation end products are tiny compounds that clog up small vessels in our body. But you know it can lead to inflammation. It can lead to a lot of damage that is maybe not appreciated because we don't necessarily do a test for it. It's not something that we follow um, routinely. But when I learned more about it, I was like, oh, people need to know this because it's not just what you eat. It's how you prepare. And and that was the point of that Mm. particular post. Um, When we cook foods at high temperatures, dry temperatures, and so um, I think I used the example of grilling in that post. Mm -hmm. When we cook things um, in certain ways, we create more of these end products in our food, and that can become toxic to our body. And so it's not just, oh, please eat this instead of that. It's also prepared Mm -hmm. in this way instead of that way. And that can be difficult when people may have an acquired taste for a certain type of preparation, but at least you have the awareness. Maybe instead of... um, you can reduce the times that you grill throughout the month or just mm-hmm. make other concessions to help improve your health. But that that's just, there's so many things that go into maintenance of wellness, right? Or attainment of wellness. There's so many things. And it's like all these little things can seem really nitpicky, but when you add them up, and as you mentioned, certain studies have shown in certain communities of color. Um, I think I saw one study in which it was in, in an elderly population that was institu- like in a nursing home or something. Mm-hmm. But when you have all these different things being added, it's mm. just the awareness needs to be there. The yeah, it's almost, there. it's almost like, uh, you know, I've had guests, you know, talk about toxins and things like that. And, and, there's, and, and it kind of goes back to what you're saying. There's so many ways we can be exposed to pollutants or toxins. And in fact, the next article I'll be writing for Diet Doctor uh, on my column is going to talk about toxins, and I'll probably talk a little bit about the uh, uh, Impossible Burger and, and mm-hmm. one of the ingredients in that, that although plant-based burgers are probably not a big deal in general, but if you're starting to add things that yes. can harm you, uh, that could be a problem. Um, and as I think about your comments, I think about uh, going back to communities of color Man, I mean, the way we prepare food, we want it to be cooked hard, yes, done all the way, <laughs> and uh, and 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 it's really something that you hear over and over again. So, who'd have thought that because of that acquired taste for it cooked that way, that that could lead to problems? So, mm-hmm. so, so you have uh, the social determinants of health that create problems. Yes. You have your own culture and how we do things that create problems, just your physiology and how you're, how you metabolize things, creating problems. Yes. So, so if there's communities that really need to hear this message is the communities of color, and we're going to reach out to all communities, mm-hmm. but man, uh, that community really needs to hear this message and learn these little nuggets so that they can understand why it's important to change how we do the things we do. So that is very, very interesting. So so let's talk a little bit about um, one thing, another thing that you uh, shared uh, that was interesting is this idea of the um, this blood, blood type diet. Um, I have a lot of patients that come to me who want to know their blood type. And, and most people don't realize we really only do blood types for the most part in conventional medicine, when you are in trouble and you need blood, because <laughs> yeah. the test results comes back pretty quickly. But, but you know, talk a little bit about what you've learned about that approach. Is there is there something to that blood type diet approach? Yeah, not from my research. It's 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 funny because um, patients will come ask me questions and I won't have the answer. I'm like, oh, let me look that up. And so that's where those segments like ask the diet is because I need to go research. Right. And so um, a lot of people would either ask, 
Should they start it because somebody told them or should they continue it and they feel good? So if they feel good on it and they're doing it, okay. The research should suggest that you're probably feeling good because you're just eating cleaner. Mm-hmm. There's not enough evidence that, um, at least from what I could gather, that eating for your blood type makes a difference to your physiology. But, um, but because of those findings, I don't recommend that somebody start it. Um, just for the desired outcome, because there's not enough evidence to support it. But um, it it was basically like, if you're this type, eat this way. Some types Mm -hmm. have more focus on animal protein, some types. Yeah, so it was interesting. And I heard Mm -hmm. it a lot within probably like within a three month period where I was like, let me go figure out there's something to this. But certainly people feel better doing it. um, Yeah. Without that, you know. Right. Yeah. And I'm always interested in, letting people do things that don't harm them, but makes them feel better. So if it's not harming you and you feel better, we're we're probably okay with that. Uh, But I think we both agree that we try to be evidence-based. And one of the things I've been the most impressed with in my functional medicine training is that they really focus on the science. And and I think they have to because they're a little bit of an outlier compared to the mainstream. So the last thing you want to do is not uh, bring evidence to support anything that you're doing. So everything that I try to share or teach or, you know, even face to face or virtually on YouTube or via podcast, I try to make sure it's grounded as much science as we know yes. while being flexible. We're going to be flexible knowing that that science may change. And if it changes, we need to be willing to change, which is why we uh, think outside the box and do the things we do. So, so I like that a lot. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, thinking about, um, there's a lot of myths about uh, functional medicine um, that we need to maybe touch on a little bit. And, um, you know, and and one of the things that I think about is people don't really utilize functional medicine clinicians probably when they should. So what what I find is that people kind of consider it like the last resort. You know what I mean? Like I've tried, I've been to uh, Harvard and Brown and they couldn't figure it out. Uh, So how would you advise somebody to think about a functional medicine clinician maybe in a slightly different way? Yeah, I think awareness is important because before I needed it, I didn't even know it existed, to be honest. Um, And when people hear functional medicine, I'm glad that you brought up that it's still evidence-based. We still use science, but we just think about diseases as illnesses differently. Mm -hmm. When I started studying functional medicine, I didn't have to relearn physiology. I just reframed it. It gave me a more evolved framework. So now I think about the relationship between the gut, the immune system, and the brain differently. It's still kind of what I learned in my first and second year of med school, but I just think about it differently now, you know? So I think awareness of what functional medicine is, that it's just addressing the root causes of what's going on, this extensive um, history taking. It may be different lab testing, depending on what's needed, but um, having an awareness of what it is and then utilizing it to maintain health. Like I, I like to see people who are feeling well mm-hmm. as much as, I mean, I don't have a preference that when I'm like, oh, it's my feeling well, and they just want to come see me. Great. Let's, let's work on maintaining that. And then the other thing is a lot of times people may feel well, but their labs may not reflect that. So either they've gotten used to something that they shouldn't, you know, they're like, oh, I didn't know I could feel better. I just thought everybody (sighs) felt, you know, sleepy after eating lunch. I thought everybody felt restless for, you know, so sometimes they're well is like, no, we can, we can work on that. So, and then if they really are well, everything reflects that, well, let's, let's keep it that way, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. That, that is, that is a, a, a very good point when I, I noticed that fairly early. It really was like in my training, it was about, you know, identify the illness and find a way to, you know, make sure you got the right illness. If you got the right illness, you know, you get some kind of trophy or something. And then you throw procedures, medicines or surgery at it. Generally speaking, that's how you do it. And then, by the way, try to work on your lifestyle. It, It was like an afterthought, you know. But what I like about functional medicine and this approach with lifestyle is it's about optimizing yourself. Mm-hmm. And 
I I always say on the podcast, I feel better at 53 than I felt when I was 33. And I'm really not making that up. So I, I want to, man, if I can pull that off when I'm 63, I can say, man, when I'm, man, at 63, I really feel as good as <laughs> I cannot, you know, wait to be able to say that. But that's ultimately what's cool. I'm a, I'm, I'm into longevity, so I think about that. I want to be here for my family as long as possible. I want to be here to share messages of healing as long as possible. But man, if you can feel better, you know, as you age, that is an incredible gift, and and that's the, this way of thinking allows for us to kind of move in that direction. So another thing I hear is this idea of, well, if this functional medicine stuff really works, you know, my doctor would be doing something with that and he'll be, you know, he or she'll be, you know, promoting that. So it must not be working if they don't know about it or understand. So what you say about that, doc? (laughs) Well, there's so, okay, well, um, yeah. It works. So this is the thing, right? So it depends on how we're going to find if it's working. Because if a conventional only doctor can get a blood sugar down with metformin or, you know, like with a medication or with insulin, well, it is working. But it's what is the cost of that worth? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes doing analysis of what the health goals are. So there's that. Like, how are we defining it's working? You're at your A1C is the goal, but we could probably also get it, not probably, we can also get it down with change in nutrition and supplement if needed, may not be needed, some weight loss. And so then the other thing is I see a lot of people um, ridiculing, you know, function because they think that it's not based in science. So education Mm -hmm. um, and awareness for a lot of people, if they're not used to it, it it must be, it must not work. It must not be Mm -hmm. real science because why didn't we learn about it in school? Right. Yeah. It is real science. How, you know, why didn't we learn? So there's so many complex answers, you know, that could come from that situation. But I just encourage people to have an open mind because for so many people, conventional only has not helped them achieve their health goals. So why not if we have something that's evidence based and safe and it's lifestyle in this and that? Why not try it? And and what I've seen is there's there's more courage in functional medicine, and maybe I shouldn't say courage, maybe I'll say because the guidelines are like chains, right? The guidelines would have never allowed me to recommend a keto, low carb, or even carnivore diet in the past. Wouldn't have been an option because the guidelines say, don't do that. Um, so, So I think what's cool about functional medicine is not only is it evidence based, but the what I see the difference is it seems like we, as the science is evolving, we are able to kind of act on it faster. Uh, I wrote my book in 2017, Fix Your Diet, Fix Your Diabetes, right? And I had a whole chapter on Fix Your Fear of Fat, right? But it, but the uh, Journal of the College of Cardiology didn't say anything about that until June of 2020. So, but this is the funny part is that the studies that say it's okay go back even further, way back. So, you know, why is it that the American Diabetes Association in at the end of 2019 all of a sudden says low carb, very low carb is okay? What took the uh, Association of Clinical Endocrinologists so long? So, so what I find about functional medicine, we start to see the science evolves and they are more comfortable moving forward with, it looks like this zinc thing is very helpful uh, in your mitochondria or whatever. So let's go ahead and do something with that information. And because we can't just sit back and watch people perish, let's, let's try to help them. And we'll combine all the knowledge we already have about how we think something, something works and we'll move forward with that approach. It's almost like a carnivore. Um, if I, if I have someone like uh, Ada Fox, who's the, known as the black carnivore, if she says to me, when I eat dairy or when I eat uh, dairy, that's animal, but if I eat certain plants and they harm me, who am I to say, keep eating the plants because they have phytonutrients? 
I mean, it doesn't make sense. So we have to have the courage to say, oh, that sounds like that's a, not a good idea for you. Let's, let's measure some things and make sure you're metabolically healthy and do this little experiment. But again, I just feel like the functional medicine docs have a little bit more courage to move forward with those thinking. So, so the other thing that can be a barrier, particularly as we think about communities of color, kind of you mentioned a little bit is the cost, right? So you mentioned that you're able to, uh, you know, kind of be under insurance plans. So is that because you have this conventional plus functional uh, medicine model? Because I think about all the tests that we learn in school. Oh my God. And I just can't imagine. I mean, if I just do one of the tests we do for, uh, you know, to see, you check for cardiovascular health is an apolipoprotein, mm-hmm. you know, B, A ratio. Uh, sometimes I'll get feedback from the, uh, the insurer saying that's experimental, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so, so how do you manage the tests that fit in this functional medicine model with the fact that the insurer doesn't always cover it or even just the, the whole model in general? How do you manage that? Yeah, it's a difficult, um, it's difficult to balance. When I was first thinking about my practice and making the decision, like, am I going to accept insurance or not? I was thinking about a lot of the patients that I already had, um, that I was already treating who may want to continue that need to use their insurance. And so I try to do as much as I can using just regular basic labs. I might add on a fasting insulin, you know, just things that will likely be okay. And then I also have worked out relationships with labs, like major lab companies for cash base. So we use insurance where we can. And because I'm I'm still on panel, I still have to meet the quality measures. Right. But they hold, you know, me too. So we do what we can with that. And then if you, you know, if we need to go further, then I try to use some discounted cash and then, you know. But it goes into different trains of thoughts. Like sometimes if we make this change and you feel better, do we need the test before and after to prove Mm -hmm. it? But, you know, if we do these things and you're still like, maybe we do need to test. So that goes back to individualized care. When I'm first meeting with a person, where are you? Even in my questionnaire, like, you know, is, is, our finances or stress. I don't want to add to your stress by saying, oh yeah, get this test for hundreds of dollars and then we can move from there. So making an individualized plan with a person, like taking into consideration their resources um, and their health goals. That's perfect. And just for anybody listening who's not as familiar with quality measures, just think of all the things that your doctor is asking you to do. I need you to get your A1C. I need you to see the eye doctor. I need you to, I need to check your feet. Uh, make sure your circulation is okay or your your sensation is okay. I need to make sure we uh, put you on the statin if you should be on the statin. Uh, so those types of things that we are being asked to do are quality measures. And and then we have to push back sometimes. There are, I have so many patients who uh, should be on the statin, but we push back because we have other things about statins that we worry about. So that's not every patient. There are p- clearly some patients who the benefit outweigh the risk, particularly those who have had a stroke or heart attack. But man, for, for a lot of other folk, it's probably not making sense. So so I think uh, what we're trying to do is live in a world where we're being, it's just like guidelines, provide guidance, but don't put chains on us. Uh, because if we're not able to be independent clinicians, then uh, we are not going to have the courage to do what myself and Dr. Evans have done, which is We've decided, oh, I think this this approach may be better for that patient. Uh, I mean, imagine, I, I, can't, I can't believe that, you know, in the last year, I have some people who are clearly uh, in that autoimmune category. And I'm like, had you tried carnivore? And they're like, what? <laughs> I was a vegan vegetarian for eight years. I mean, it's almost going back to that word blasphemous. <laughs> to suggest, but, you know, they try it and then uh, the, the world opens up for them. It's like the perfect elimination diet. So, so I just wanted to get a feel for that as well. And, um, you know, when you think about, um, for you, this idea of thinking outside the box, um, when you think about how it's affected, I know you had some inspiration from dad, but, you know, how has that changed your life in terms of how you deal with your patients, how you view life in general? 
Um, I don't see limits where I may have seen them 10 years ago. Yeah. I like um, that. It's like when you can change the way you look at things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's freeing. <laughs> Ooh. Yes. Yeah. And, and I love that response is very to the point and it's, it's a game changer and that's, that applies to every part of our lives. Um, it's not just being a clinician. It's, uh, how I lead. It's how I deal with my kids. It's, uh, it's how I approach a lot of circumstances. Even if somebody cuts in front of me, I'm like, Hmm, let me think outside the box. <laughs> there's probably a good reason why they had to cut in front of me, right? Even if it's something, I remember, I'm having a flashback, I remember early in the morning, um, I was uh, on the road and 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 literally this person was driving fast behind me. I saw them coming and I saw that they were trying to merge in front of me. There was no room to do that, right? So my brain knew that, okay, now my car is gonna get scraped. And of course they, so, because they didn't stop, my brain started thinking outside the box. I said, it's probably, and just, I saw, it, I glanced over at the lady, look, she was on drugs, right? So so me understanding and thinking, instead of getting upset or angry, I just was able to say, hey, this is, she's probably on drugs. She's probably, you know, who knows where she's going. But I just, I'm always trying to put my, my, my brain in the brain of others. And yes. what are they thinking? What are they experiencing? And, uh, and, and, and part of that way of thinking helps me to think outside the box and, and to try things differently and, and to hear people and, and to hear, like, I'll learn something from you, you'll learn something from me. And I think that that way of living is going to make life a little bit richer because you may do some things that you hadn't planned to because somebody put that little, that little birdie put something in your brain. So, so it sounds like we don't like a lot of sugar and starch because we've talked about glycation. What other uh, things that you that you, that you really emphasize with your patients? I know it's a, not a lot of time in twenty minutes, but what kind of things do you throw at them during those short visits to make sure they're on the right path? Um, I want to know how they're moving if they're moving. So along with the food diary or your food journal, I'm going to ask about physical activity. And I want to know about relationships. I see a lot of families. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, of course, I have to respect HIPAA. Um, mm. But I want to know about how relationships are going in the home, in the workplace, because all of those things affect the health. If, if I'm talking about dietary changes that need to happen, I need to know who's cooking. Are you mm -hmm. eating out? Da -da. So I, I do a lot of time asking about lifestyle. And once you spend a lot of time you know, asking those questions, getting the good foundation, the follow-up appointments, you can just check in, you can mm -hmm. check in, you can celebrate the wins and then fine tune what needs to happen to keep pushing towards the mark of health. Yeah. I, I've gotten a lot of nuggets from just talking to people and asking open-ended questions. And, and then you'll find those little things. Oh, I can, okay. Ms. Jones, if you just focus, maybe we can work on that. Uh, or I'll say, you know, hey, is there one thing you know you probably could do better? One area in your life you can do better? What's that area that you're willing to, you know, work on? And a lot of times they'll kind of help us out. And But if you don't ask those questions and you just kind of, you know, top down, I'm just going to tell you what's best for you, people will struggle uh, because they're, cause they're not really taking ownership of it. So you kind of having those dialogues, building rapport, trust, it really equals them doing better usually. So I think that's really important. And I like that idea, although movement won't necessarily be the, the key to weight loss, it's definitely helpful for metabolic health and it's certainly helpful for maintaining weight loss and people got to move. We're, we were meant to move. And if we don't move, it's over. And of course, we talk about stress and sleep and things like that. But, but I think if we, we ask the right questions, we'll find uh, the answers. The good news is that if you give them an overarching approach, try to eat more of this and less of that, give them maybe a handout, uh, encourage them to uh, do you do what about intermittent fasting? Is that part of 
any of those discussions that you have with patients? Yes. Um, I have a lot of people who do really well and some people, you know, some people who are just like, it's not for them and that's fine, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, I like talking about it and often I'm fasting when I'm seeing them. So, you know, right. I can use, use my real experience to kind of help guide, but it's, it's, it's a great tool. And I, I, I always present it, you know, like, oh, you don't have to spend any extra money. Like it helps me get out of the house on time in the morning. I'm not worrying about breakfast. And so, um, as far as ease and convenience, it's up there. People mm-hmm. have no idea, like, and and to not think about food, even as we record um, fasting, it wasn't really intentional. It just happened that way. <laughs> so I uh, didn't get lunch, but uh, you feel fine. And uh, man, I remember before I was an intermittent faster, how I just would be starving right now of uh, recording this uh at least my time at four in the uh, afternoon. And I just, um, I got a little water in front of me and I feel fine. So it's such a freeing thing yes. to not be a prisoner of food. I, I don't even think about lunch much at all, except that it's time to have lunch when it's time to have lunch. And I'll eat it because I need to, you know, ha- have lunch, but, but it's nice to be free. So it's like so freeing, but again, We have to be flexible and that that's not for everybody. And, you know, you hear stories about maybe it's harder for some ladies than the guys, whatever. I I just tell people, listen to your body, uh, maybe do the diet stuff first. And then once you feel that you're in a good spot and you're not as hungry, maybe that's the time to do it because your body will absolutely talk to you and let you know what you need to do. So so that's that's all good stuff. So it's I'm feeling good and I'm hoping that that people who are listening to this episode are more open to considering a functional medicine doctor. And again, we're a little different. We can cheat a little bit because we still got that conventional medicine, you know, badge on our <laughs> shoulders. But but I think it's important that more clinicians see the world through this different lens because I think more people will heal. And until I started this lifestyle approach, I just didn't see the number of people heal. Uh, that I'm seeing now, it's it's mind-boggling and and sometimes shocking uh, when you see so many people getting off medicine and and just doing so much better, and and then we've learned how to help those who struggle. And it may take uh, if some people it's like the next visit they're like doing phenomenal and they're like off their medicine, and for others it takes a few years because life happens, you yes. know. So so when it comes to your life, doc. You know, when you think about the next 12 months, um, you know, when it comes to protecting your nest, um, what aspects of the nest and rope, rather it's the nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, how we think, recovering from trauma, healthy relationships, shout out to your husband and and those two beautiful kids, uh, avoiding organisms. And by the way, in Chicago, as of the, the day before this recording, we had 51,000 cases in one day. Ouch. So it's so you have to protect yourself from organisms and pollutants. And then of course, our life experiences and our uh, emotions have to be protected. So what's, what's your what's your focus areas over the next 12 months? Um, it's going to be um, reducing stress and improved sleep. Because up until recently, like maybe like two weeks ago, I was like, go, 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 go. Who needs to sleep? Well, it turns out I do. So <laughs> I'm going to go to sleep. Yeah. And reduce stress. Um, just take time to actively reduce stress. So I can listen, reflect. Um, because I think sometimes when I go, 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 I, I miss aha moments. I miss time to like really rejuvenate and it's not fair to my physical, mental, mm-hmm. emotional health. So mm-hmm. that, that'll that work. Um, <laughs> coffee and things like that. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm actually, um, think, you know, speaking of sleep, I'm, I'm on a, I'm doing a little bit of experiment. Uh, so I'm going to try, see how I can do without coffee. Um, and I, I want coffee to be something I drink when I need it, as opposed to every day. It's a habit now. I like the warm, you know, feeling on my throat, but because uh, again, I think what I want people to do is to experiment, try different dietary approaches, 
you know, see how much sleep you really need. They always say somewhere between six and eight hours, but, you know, see what your body wants. For me, it's like six and a half to seven hours. I can't even, I try to sleep, I just can't. So, but if I get six hours, I don't feel as good. So I have to get six and a half to seven, who knows why, but that's what it is. (laughs) So, so thank you for sharing uh, your journey. Thank you for sharing, uh, you know, a little bit about what this functional medicine life is like and how you're using it to impact the world. And for those who want to hear more, uh, how can they find you? Um, my practice website is www.livehealth-e.com. If you Google my name, it comes up. On Instagram, I'm Akita underscore Evans and Facebook, Dr. Akita Evans, MD and PH. All right. Love it. So uh, uh, overachiever, staying in school. I appreciate you. I appreciate all you <laughs> added to this uh, this uh, podcast episode. And again, again, I'll remind everybody again that we will do a book review. Uh, uh, Dr. Evans has become a little bit of a book club uh, member and we're just trying to uh, learn and grow. So we'll, we'll be talking about the big leap. So what I'll do uh, is once we get that out, I'll circle back around and throw that into the uh, show notes for this episode so people can uh, check out that uh, episode as well. So thank you again for being with me today. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So today, guys, we, we've gotten a few more insights uh, from Dr. Evans and, uh, you know, about functional medicine and, and how those skills have really allowed her and myself included to have the skills to understand how to be a, uh, kind of a detective and to understand the root causes of many of the chronic illnesses that plague our patients, you know. And and I really don't think we ever want to settle, you know, and I don't want you to settle. Uh, so when you struggle and you and you don't really have an answer and our and your conventional doc hasn't really found that answer, consider uh, finding a functional medicine doctor just as an additional tool. And and with that different approach, there may be some discoveries that you hadn't uh, thought about. So, but thankfully, uh, you know, as you have learned from us, there are more and more clinicians who are being trained to learn how to heal patients uh, this way. And I also want to do a shout out to the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, which is on a mission to help educate clinicians about metabolic health and why that's so critical to help people heal. So, so as always, I thank everybody who's here, whether you're watching on YouTube or uh, listening on your favorite podcast app. I really appreciate you guys. Put some comments in the uh, in the comment section if you have a, a Apple uh, version, or if it's in the uh, YouTube video, make sure you make comments because people learn from each other. I learn a ton from my patients and I learn a lot from you. So, so until we have another episode, be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest.